here and we are happy and relieved that the reopening of the schools has been postponed a little bit to avoid children the heat and the sun. Beginning of an academic year is a time when we take the next step in right direction and also it's a time for a lot of anxiety and angst, anxiety about our future and angst about the expectations which were not fulfilled. And in the church it is a usual practice that we normally recognize the students who were very successful, mark them out, call them to the friend and award them. And we should be sensitive in the church that church should not only recognize those who succeed when the world the whole world turns its eyes upon those who succeed and upload them the church should search for those who fail to succeed and encourage them to try one more time to succeed the next time I certainly believe that church is not the gallery of achievers but church should be a lighthouse for all those who struggle to find right direction. So the ministry of the church should be directed towards guiding the students and youngsters, counseling them and guiding them when they find going tough or confused because of the many ways and opportunities that is on offer for them. This is a student Sunday and I greet all the students of this congregation that God may give them wisdom and knowledge, understanding and to encourage them that whatever they undertake to study, whatever branch it may be, whatever level of their studies, if they apply themselves totally to know the depths of their subject, they will be success in their lives. Education is nothing but drawing out full potential from the given opportunity. Whatever be the given opportunity, we are given education to draw out full potential to succeed. And when we talk about succeed, success, the more important dimension of success is how to succeed in a morally and ethical way. Using the given opportunity to succeed morally and in an ethical way is the wisdom. And that wisdom is given from above, given from God, and that wisdom is to be asked from God. Today I said before the congregation to youngsters who had uh, this opportunity of princely privileges and uh, I want you to th think through how they used their privileges whether they were successful in their lives or whether they have squandered their opportunities. One was Solomon, the other is Daniel. One is supposed to have asked for wisdom from God and the other though he did not ask for wisdom openly, nevertheless conducted himself wisely. We have read in 1 Kings chapter 3 how Solomon asked for wisdom from God and he is supposed to have been endowed with an extraordinary wisdom. What did he do with that wisdom? That is the question. Did Solomon use the wisdom to serve God and to serve the people over whom he was given kingship. The Bible narration tells us that Solomon did not succeed in serving God 
Solomon did not use his wisdom in serving the people over whom he was given kingship. Solomon used his wisdom to aggrandize himself. First King chapter 6 verse 38 tells us that Solomon used seven years in building the temple of Jerusalem. And the very next verse, First Kings chapter 7 verse 1, the author rather accusingly records that Solomon spent 13 years in building his own palace. Spending seven years for the house of God and 13 years to build his own palace. The description of Solomon's life depict him to be a megalomaniac, a person who always overreaches the usefulness, a person who was not able to do anything in an appropriate way within an appropriate range. In 1 Kings chapter 4, the whole chapter, the author accusingly records how Solomon was abusing his power. His, record, his gluttonous habits and his greedy taxations. Solomon's one day portion may feed a small village for months. And Solomon employed special officers for taxation in an agrarian society. In First King chapter 11, we find that Solomon's unsatiable cravings even extended to his marital life. Solomon had many wives who led him astray. The juggernaut was ruling on, so much so that God himself was forced to raise enemies against Solomon. Solomon asked for wisdom, God gave him wisdom, and Solomon abused God-given wisdom. He abused his people. And God had to stop Solomon on his track. First King chapter 11, verse 14 and 23, we, find, we read how God himself raised enemies to stop Solomon. Solomon was unwise in using his opportunity that not only ruined his life, but also it ruined his whole kingdom. He inherited a kingdom of Israel with 12 tribes from Saul the king. Saul was a simple agrarian king. And then his father David was a warrior king. And Solomon inherited the kingdom of Israel with 12 tribes from these two kings, first kings. And Solomon was the third king who ruled the kingdom of Israel in full. And after Solomon's time, the kingdom of Israel tore apart into two. Ten tribes of Israel went away from the house of David, rebelled and went away from him. Only Judea, Judea and Benjamin remained with the house of David. Solomon was a person who had a royal opportunity to serve God and he squandered everything in the pursuit of personal pleasures and aggrandizement. So on this student Sunday, when we think about wisdom from above, even if that wisdom is given from above, what are we going to do with that wisdom? That is the question before us today. To what end we use our wisdom and our knowledge. The next person that I want to set before the congregation is another student who refused to indulge in royal pleasures when it was spread before him. That was Daniel. Daniel was an young student and he along with us Friends, Ananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were brought to imperial palace because they were found to be young, handsome, skillful, 
knowledgeable, artistic and wise. And because of their usefulness for an emperor or for an empire, they were given royal portions from the kingly table and the royal pleasures and privileges were theirs to enjoy. It was on a spread before them. However, they refused to indulge in the worldly pleasures. Unlike Solomon who fell head over heels, Daniel and his friends kept their piety, they kept their sanctity and they kept their witness in front of the unbelievers. Daniel and friends, the first chapter itself tells us that they abstained from food. They abstained from polluting food. So students and youngsters in the present society must think about the virtue of abstinence, saying no to an offer. The world does everything to set before us all that is polluting, all that is corrupting. The world will entice and tell us that this is the way, this is the trend. You consume this, you wear this, you look trendy, you be with this group at this time, that is what is fashionable. It is very hard for our students and youngsters today to say no to all these consumeristic enticement but youngsters have to learn to say no. Daniel and his friends had that spiritual conviction to say no when they were given all these royal privileges which we never had in their own uh, at, at home. St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 10 verse 23, I have a right to do everything but everything is not beneficial. I have a right to do anything, but everything is not constructive. So, youngsters of this present generation must see and evaluate how so many of unworthy and polluting things that try to dominate our minds and senses and how to stand up to them and not to allow them to dominate us and to ask for wisdom to distinguish among them what will be worthy and what will be constructive for our lives. In Daniel chapter 3 we find another incident, incident when the king, the emperor, puts up a gold, golden statue of himself and asks every one of his citizens to bow down and worship before that statue. And Daniel's friends refused to bow down and worship. And consequently, they were thrown into the fiery furnace and God was with them in the fiery furnace to save them. And in the same way, Daniel had a trial when the emperor decreed that none of his citizens should worship any other god except the emperor himself. And Daniel resolved to disobey that royal command and decree and continued worshiping the true god the Lord and Savior. And when Daniel was thrown into the lion's den, the Lord was with him to save him. Daniel was not called wise. Daniel did not ask for wisdom. Neither Daniel asked for courage. But he had a simple piety and determination not to pollute himself with the worldly powers, worldly pleasures, are not to be cowed down by the dominating evil forces which are anti-God. He had a spiritual conviction, uh, even as an angster, 
and he stood up for God and God was on his side. So on this Student Sunday, Education Sunday, we should evaluate ourselves and our educations, whether our education give, uh, gives us enough clarity and conviction to know what is good and what is bad, whether our education gives us the, the conviction to stand up for all that which may be polluting and corrupting our lives. It is sad that today's education does not give us that courage and conviction and fortitude for the youngsters to stand up for all the life-destructing forces. Today's education is designed, designed to make the youngsters to yearn quite a lot and to spend lavishly and to become the slave of the market. The world calls us to worship the mammon and to serve the market. Instead, the education should help us to gain courage and fortitude in face of temptations that may dominate and threaten us and help us to stand up for our own spiritual stands and give us fortitude to say no to all the corrupting influences. If you stand up to them, God will ultimately stand along with us. So on this Student Sunday, I would like to greet all the youngsters of this congregation that God may fill them with wisdom, knowledge and understanding. God gave them courage to stand up against all the polluting influences of this world and give them fortitude and spiritual conviction to say no to all that will lead them to corruption. Stand up for God and God will stand on your side.